I'm going live. Please rise. It's a good guy. Yeah. Now, I'm Owen Sounds tonight. We have to remember a retired firefighter, Robert McDonald, who passed away this, a few days ago. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We'll have to tell the sewer commission we've got a blockage here. <laughs> call the order. Roll call city council meeting January 27, 2014. Councilor Connell. Present. Councilor Cronin. Present. Councilor Argus. Present. Councilor Junta. Present. Councilor Hartwood. Present. Councilor Hirsch. Here. Councilor Kinsey. Present. Councilor Tonta. Present. Councilor Vogel. Present. Councilor Cameron. Here. Councilor Craig Here. They file items. You'll see three items on your desk. The first one is the Franklin Street ordinance that was left out of the packet. We'll call it a scrivener's error. It's not really a late file. There are two late files, communication five, which is uh, the blue, sorry, is the um, TDR letter from Roger Foster, mm -hmm. called a so-called uh, TDR study. There's a communication number six, which is the mayor's update. Motion to wait for the rule set this late file. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I had a meeting at seven, but I'll talk to you after. Since I'm Mike, Mr. President, I've been asked to remind everybody to uh, see if you are powered on and your mics and also whether you are on mute. Are you <laughs> David McFarlane. <laughs> <laughs> David McFarlane, 2057th Street. I'd like to talk about a couple of things. First of all, Plum Island Water and Sewer. I encourage the city to have emergency plans, not only for the water and sewer project, but what's likely to happen out there because it's being accelerated and it's being changed. And I don't think it takes a genius to know that there's going to be a disaster out there sooner or later, either with the water and sewer program, not only because of what's going to be talked about tonight, but other things. Secondly, I'd like to talk about executive session. I don't believe you should go into executive session for two reasons, three reasons. Many executive, dozens of the executive sessions happened during the water and sewer project. Most of them were gone into, as far as I'm concerned, illegally. I've never heard a good reason for executive session. I've never seen any minutes 12 years later for the executive sessions that were gone into. There's supposed to be public information after, after a period of time. I doubt if you'll ever find anything useful in them, but you ought to look at them anyway, and you ought to make them public. Secondly of all, my understanding is the only legitimate reason you can go into executive sessions, the state law lists 10 specific reasons. The only one that comes close is litigation, not potential litigation, unless it's immediately likely or being threatened. If that's not the case, I ask you, counselors, to think very seriously about going into this and document everything that's said in him correctly. Because I think some of the problems you're having out now with the water and sewer problem wouldn't have happened if a lot of things were public. And not only executive sessions, but non-public meetings. First of all, all Plum Island lost the right to vote individually, separately, on this project because of a non-public meeting. Secondly, CDM was selected in a non-public meeting 80 to do, this, do the study project on this program 
80% higher than the other two bidders after a deselection project down to three. For 80% higher price and half the work. They were seven months late delivering this project. It was just a study project, no reason to be late, no permits, nothing. The only thing being seven months late gave them a sole source contract for the, uh, for the other phases of the program. This went on in an executive session, or a non-public meeting, by the way, not an executive session. Council, some of the councils were there. So please, think hard about going into executive session. Don't make it worse, make it better. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Kristen Varro. <coughs> Uh, my name is Kristen Farrell. I'm a Spofford Street resident. Um, you'll be voting on my appointment this evening to the Commission on Disabilities. I wanted to just come and introduce myself. Um, I am an American Sign Language interpreter by profession. I work with um, deaf and deafblind individuals throughout the Commonwealth and Southern New Hampshire and New England. Um, and I have two children. My children have spinal muscular atrophy, which is a degenerative neuromuscular disease. My son <coughs> is two and uses a wheelchair, and my daughter is one, and she um, does not yet have any symptoms. So I'm looking forward to my appointment on the commission, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Jenny Donahue. Hello, everyone. I just wanted to follow up my soon-to-be compadre. Um, introduce myself to some of the newer members to the council. I'm the chairman of the Disability Commission, and I just wanted to put it out there that while we are getting more and more members, as I'm sure you've noticed over the last few months, which is fantastic, um, we still need more. And I wanted to extend invitations to um, all council members, but especially new ones as well, to visit a meeting, um, consider joining. We, we, we do need a city employee to be on the commission as well. And it would be wonderful to have um, a liaison to the city council. So uh, again, just thank you and nice to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Josh Castell. Uh, hi, um, my name's Josh Casteller. I live at 15 Cutting Drive and I'm up for appointment to the Mosley Woods Commission and our Parks Commission. I just wanted to say hello, and if you had any questions, I'm right here. Thank you. Thank you. That's it for public comment. <coughs> you want the mayor comment? Thank you, good evening, Council President, Councilors. It's a pleasure to be here again as we start the new term with this new addition to the City Council meeting with my update. Uh, in addition to the narrative that you received via email and now is part of uh, tonight's packet, I just wanted to highlight a, a couple important components in the update. Uh, one is that uh, we are uh, concerned, despite at the MMA conference this past week in Mass Municipal Association annual conference, where we met with uh, members of the administration and finance, Governor Patrick was there, and talked about his House One budget and you know, talked about the uh, increases in the local aid, Chapter 70 funding, school funding. Uh, unfortunately, as you look through the way the formulas are um, allocated per community, Newburyport does not fare well with the House One budget. Uh, we are fortunate that Speaker DeLeo was there and talked about how he plans to do a better job in terms of increasing house, uh, increasing local aid, and we certainly will be advocating for that, mm -hmm. and I will keep you posted as the budget process unfolds. We are experiencing a decrease in $300,000. Uh, extra $200,000 will be diverted from our school chapter our allocation to the charter school. And again, not to say that there's anything wrong with charter schools, but we've been advocating that there's a problem with the funding mechanism for charter schools and the impact that it has on our school funding. We're all aware of the deficit that we're trying to close the gap this year with our school funding, and it's not a good position to go into our FY15 budget, so we will continue to advocate for changes in uh, those 
funding uh, formulas in addition we're receiving a little less money for veterans. Uh, I think that one we can absorb, it's only $30,000, but I'm mostly concerned about our local aid and our school funding. I've already reached out to Representative Costello and to Senator Ives to let them know that we are not pleased with um, the initial uh, presentation. Tomorrow night I will be attending the Governor's State of the Commonwealth and we'll certainly have an opportunity to continue advocating for our community on behalf of our um, FY15 budget. Uh, in addition, I just wanted to uh, point out a couple other uh, factors that are a couple other points I presented in my update. And uh, one is that um, we are, after a long process of advocating for a barrier, a wall, a fence for the residents on the side of um, 95 North of the Whittier Bridge project, we were able to get, it went up to the federal government, federal highway, came back and approved uh, that we could, the mayor could negotiate directly with Walsh McCor, our contractor, in terms of working out details of building the biggest <laughs> fence that we possibly can uh, to help uh, those neighbors on that side. So uh, that was good news. We are also, as you may recall, uh, we, the Walsh McCor mitigation for using uh, city property, we were able to get them to pay for the uh, paraglass, the divider that will separate the shared use path between the eight lanes of highway and uh, it will be absolutely uh, magnificent and a much safer uh, way for residents to travel and connect Newburyport, Amesbury and Salisbury rail trails. So we will be working with the planning office to finalize our mitigation agreement with Walsh McCourt which will include now um, this updated fence. We also found out recently too that they're looking for additional access paths to 95 rather than using the exit so we have to sort of work out those details as part of the mitigation agreement. But as you um, know by now that uh, anything in addition to what uh, is being used on city property, uh, my hand goes out and I ask for mitigation for the city. So we will continue to do that to and advocate uh, for the residents, especially those who are being impacted uh, by the Whittier Bridge project. Um, in addition, we are in the process of putting together um, <coughs> our, our budget. We began working with the department heads and things are moving forward on that front and we'll certainly keep you uh, updated as we, as we move forward in that process. And uh, unless you have additional questions for me, I think most of the other information in your packet um, covers what we've been working on over the last, last couple weeks. Uh, oh, one other piece I just wanted to highlight for the public too is that we met with uh, two finalists for um, the zoning. Uh, you allocated uh, $60,000 for the city to put out to bid a contract to have a complete holistic review of our zoning which hasn't been done since 1987. We met with um, and interviewed two potential groups this past week and hope to by the end of the week or maybe early next week to begin to award this contract so that we can be begin moving this process forward which is very important to our city. Um, I appreciate the work that uh, Councillor Eigerman has put before the council mm -hmm. in regard to some interim measures to protect so and preserve some of our uh, historic structures, including downtown, and look forward to our review of those um, documents that he put before you so that we can move forward to, again, work on protecting our historic structures in the city. And finally, uh, we are just about finalized in terms of our teams to begin moving forward and updating our master plan. We're a little bit um, behind the gun in terms of doing this. If you have not been uh, assigned to a team, please get in touch with myself, Kate, or Andy Port in the planning office and we'll be sure that you get um, to be part of this process. It will be a very public, open process as we move forward and update our master plan, which is an important guiding document for our city. Uh, please remember that um, the city council, the rest of the public is hosting a uh, open public comment night tomorrow on the waterfront, which will be followed by Wednesday night, which is a public meeting to invite all the residents to come together and business members to talk about any ideas that you'd like to put forth to celebrate our 250th anniversary. Uh, in addition, we are 
on February 5th, we'll be hosting the meeting with the City Council, the NRA, and the City to just have a round table to be sure that we're all starting on the same place as we begin to start a new open and inclusive process to talk about what's going to happen on our waterfront. And also Thursday night, it will be an opportunity to meet with the architects regarding the transient voter facility. So awful lot going on and uh, thank you for your time and I will be back in a little while to talk about Plum Island Water and Sewer. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Move on to the consent agenda. Which consists this evening of the approval of the minutes for the January 6th, which was the inauguration, and the January 13th City Council meeting, both in for approval. There are no transfers. There are four communications. First communication is secondhand motor vehicle license renewal Plum Auto Works, that's in for approval. <coughs> the second is a one fund, uh, 2.6 mile charity road race sponsored by the Winter Circle to be held April 13, 2014, referred to public safety. And next is the third annual Pan Mass Challenge Kids Ride for June 22, 2014, again going to public safety. And fourth, a mid-year budget report to be referred to budget and safety. There's uh, <clears throat> five first reading of appointments. First, Leslie Eckold, 36 Warren Street, Fruit Street, uh, Local Historic District Commission until March 1st, 2017. Three reappointments, David Zink, 6 Laurel Road, Electrical Inspector, January 31st, 2015. Next, Anthony J. Fanari, 10 Olson Road, Peabody, Director, DPS, February 1st, 2017. And James McCarthy, 17 Russia Street, to the planning board until January 31st, 2019. That's the consent agenda this evening. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to move appointment number one. Appointment one, please. Anything else? Motion to approve as amended. Second. Yeah. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It's removed. Move on to the regular agenda. I would entertain a motion to take order three out of order so we can d discuss this before to accept the gift from the Rotary Club. <coughs> so moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Move on to order three. States uh, January 27, 2014, that the City Council of the City of Newburyport accepts with gratitude the gift in the amount of $2,000 from the Rotary Club of Newburyport for beautification of the Newburyport Roundabout at the corners of Mosley Avenue, Spofford Street, and Merrimack Street. Submitted Councilor Charles F. Tonto. Move that we accept. Yes. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Of course, I love the roundabout, so, you know, I've been pushing for this for 10 years, so this is a, a great pleasure to me to be here to accept money from the Rotary Club, so thank you very much. <laughs> I just would like to, to say that the Rotary is such an important civic organization in our community and continues to step up and do wonderful things to support our community. And this is just another example of how they have come forward to help with plantings and would also like to say that we don't have to worry about all these wonderful plantings because Latitudes, uh, John Grassi is going to be taking weekly care of um, the planting, so it will continue to look lovely for all to enjoy. Even though it was a difficult construction project, it's uh, <laughs> now done. And thank you so much on behalf of the city of Newburyport. Thank, thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you. to the presentation of water and sewer treatment plants. Which I'm told will take about four minutes, right? Four minutes. <coughs> no questions then. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, now we're up for four hours. <laughs> uh, 
For the councilors that don't know me, I am Peter Hartford. I've been the uh, owner's project manager on the sewer project dating back to May of 2009. Uh, and we're close to an end on both projects. But with me tonight, I'd just like to recognize Tony Canari, Director of Public Services. Uh, the chairman of the Sewer Commission, David Hanlon, is behind me here. And then out in the hallway is Chief Operator of the Sewer Plant, Joe Dugan. Um, with that, I'd just like to... Uh, Mm. Mm. Mood lighting, too. It's good. Yeah. And for the councillors that were on the uh, committee um, or council uh, from before, the last time I was before you was, I think, November of 2012. At that point, we were finishing the first contracts and starting the second contracts. So um, I'm really going to try and focus on the work that's been done since that time. Um, but I will touch upon the work that was done previously. Uh, first thing is that the sewer treatment plant, as you may know, we packaged the, the project in two different uh, contracts so that we could maximize the uh, ARA funding that was available at the time. Contract one, where we got the ARA funding, that was substantially completed in July of 2012. Uh, contract two um, was just recently uh, completed uh, or reached a substantial completion point as of November 20th of the last year, 2015. Um, this is just a listing of the major uh, components of contract one. Um, you know, I don't want to run through all of them, but you know, I basically just you know, included some photos. This is the new operation control laboratory building that was constructed. It's a lead, um, uh, it was designed following the lead principles. We are in the process of submitting our lead application and hope to find out uh, in the next couple months what level uh, we achieved in the lead uh, rating system. This is one of the primary clarifiers, and you can uh, you may be able to see around the um, the uh, this white here. That's a laundry cover. That's provided for odor control purposes. That was one of the uh, major things that was included in that um, upgrade. And then in uh, this building here is another new building. It's the aeration blower building. These are the aeration tanks, and you may not be able to see it just because of the lighting, but we used to have these big mixers that were mechanical mixers. Now we have diffused air that's being um, pumped into the tanks, and um, it diffuses up through the bottom of the tank. It's a much more efficient operation. Contract two um, essentially involved demolition of the existing process building that was there, replacement of all the mechanical equipment in that building, um, and upgrading the sludge to watering system uh, that is implemented at the treatment plant. The first part was the headworks building here. And again, I apologize, it's, I don't know if we can do anything with the lighting, but um, the headworks is this small building here. Um, and, it, you know, we basically stripped the exterior of it, uh, refurbished it, put a new roof on it, and then on the inside of it, we installed a, uh, uh, this is a, a mechanical step screen that uh, <coughs> sorts out all the debris and, and rags and what have you that come into the plant. This is a tube that basically, it, it um, once it removes it, it has a wash system that washes it, dries it, and then forces it up this tube into a con con uh, container for, um, Disposal. It, it may not seem like a lot to you, but it does help the process because of the, the, over the years, the treatment plant operators have had a lot of problems with clogging of pumps because we don't have this level of treatment right at the front door of the plant. And here's the, uh, the new operations building that was constructed. Um, there's basically two sides of it, um, and you can differentiate them based on the, the type of roofing. This is the metal roofing with a, with a pitch on it. Over here we have the, uh, the flat roof. This is just from the other side. Again, this side is where we basically have our sludge be watering operation. Um, and there's a truck bay garage here where we discharge the sludge into it. On the other side we have uh, maintenance uh, areas, uh, locker room facilities for the operators and other uh, storage areas. Downstairs, you can see here, these are the new instrument pumps that were installed. Um, there was a period that during construction where we were bypassing our flow in order to install these new pumps, but they're all up and running now. 
These are the gravity thickeners that are behind the building. These were renovated. Um, the exteriors were uh, stripped of the brick and we replaced it with metal siding. The roofs used to have these ugly green uh, domes on them. We have a low profile uh, roofs on them now. And the piping that you see over here, um, that's odor controlled. Um, basically, we take the air, um, we suck the air out of those uh, tanks and then put them into a bio filter. And then the interior the mechanical equipment of that, um, these two tanks were also replaced as part of the equipment. These are the new Fournier presses. That these uh, take care of the sludge due watering. Um, there are two six channel um, presses that were installed. Uh, they are very efficient and uh, remove, you know, they basically take a, a, a liquid that comes into it with 4% solids and dries it to about 25% solids. And then from there, it's parked to a uh, compost facility in uh, Ipswich. These are just new pumps that were installed, and these are below um, ground. Uh, these basically feed the, uh, the sludge to the, the new presses. And here we are. This is our truck bay garage. So there, this is the conveyor that comes from the presses and it goes into this uh, conveyor chute and it discharges into the various the two different trucks depending on which one is uh, being loaded and how much material is in there. Once, they, uh, once they're filled, they, we haul that out to uh, it's the stuff I mentioned before. Now, here's the, uh, the budget um, update. Um, as you all recall, back in November of, I think, 2011, we, we came to City Council to increase the budget on the project for a variety of different reasons. Um, and it went to from the original 26.38 to the 32.65. Um, here you can see the current distribution of the cost. Um, obviously, the bulk of it was related to construction, $1.4 million. Um, and then, you know, it, it, it's divided up, um, amongst the various different um, pools of money um, that we had set up for the budget. So that's the sewer plant project. This is just the, the last thing I wanted to point out as far as um, the project costs because of the, uh, the various different uh, grant funding that we did receive. We did. Uh, we were able to reduce that 32.65 um, and get it closer to the original budget. So, um, as you can see, the 32.65 that was from excuse me, September of, uh, of 2011. This is the original project cost. So, when you subtract that, you wind up with about 6.3 million dollars. Um, we do have to pay issuance costs because the project is being funded through the SRF loan. Um, and right now we have a budget of 67000 for that. And then the next three line items represent our grant funding. Uh, the bulk of it came from the federal money. Um, we did get two different grants uh, that totaled $4.4 million. We also received a little over $100,000 in rebates from National Grid for various different uh, energy improvements that were made. And then we uh, just recently um, sold three small parcels of land to the abutting residents, um, which resulted in a revenue of about 22000 So the net increase in the project cost from the 26.38 is one point, let's call it $1.8 million. Um, the only thing that's not included here, which is another potential revenue source, is the um, sale or the surplus of the remaining, the remainder of the 115 uh, Water Street uh, lot. There is an existing building that we've been using for storage as well as uh, for the um, contractor's construction area. Um, I believe that once we're done, the, the intent is that that building and the land around it may be surplus, but that there's nothing set in stone there. But that's another potential um, source of revenue to further reduce the uh, the net increase in the project cost. With that, I'd like to turn our focus now to the water treatment project. Um, this again was divided into different phases. As far as the water treatment plant project, it was two phases. The first phase was the construction of the new clear well. Um, that has been completed now for over a year. 
um, and it's fully operational. Um, phase two was to do some water distribution system improvements, and that was completed back in December of 2011. The one that was most notable to all you probably was the work that was done um, with replacing the, uh, the water main over Route 95, because during that time, we did cause some uh, traffic issues to people trying to get on, get on and off the, uh, the highway. And then phase three is, uh, we call it the miscellaneous water treatment plant upgrades. Um, but I can kind of give you a, a little more detail on that. Um, like I said, phase one, the major part was the construction of the clear well. We also uh, did some work in the uh, sludge lagoons. This is the new clear well and pump station building. Um, I left in the picture that we had in there where it was, uh, it was green, there was no snow. Um, but uh, if you recall, we, we all invited you out back in June when we dedicated the building to uh, George Loeller, the, uh, the former chairman of the Water Commission. Um, we've been very pleased with this building and um, it, we, it's functioning without uh, any incident. These are just uh, a picture or photo of the, the pumps that are ins installed within that building. Uh, there's two sets of pumps. One set of pumps, the smaller pumps here, are for finished water. They pump the, the water into the uh, water distribution system. And then there's these larger pipes here and the pumps that are associated with backwash pumps. Um, every day we backwash the filters and it requires a tremendous amount of water in a short period of time. So we need to uh, the larger pumps for that. This was just a, a standby generator that was installed as part of that uh, project. And then the new uh, over overflow structures in the lagoons that were installed. Phase two, like I mentioned, was a variety of different um, water distribution system improvements. They were a lot of um, small pieces of water main that were installed to eliminate dead ends in various parts of the city. Um, basically, we like to loop all the, uh, the water pipe. And like I said, the last one, the installing the, the liner across uh, Route 95 is the one problem notice. Phase three um, included the demolition work for the old clear well, as well as um, the spring lane valve house. Um, replacement of a lot of mechanical equipment in the existing building, upgraded the skating system. And then the biggest construction item was uh, a new flow equalization tank and a recycled pump station. And that was basically built in the footprint of the old clear well. Here's a photo of the old clear well. They had, um, they basically had stripped it down here um, and were preparing to demo that uh, existing concrete structure. And it, it went very easily. This is the new flow equalization tank that's in that same footprint. You can just see the, 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 the top of the wall there. It, it does not, um, you know, it, it's fairly low to the ground. And then in the background, you can see some valves and pumping. Basically, the flow equalization tank, what that does is, um, normally when the, the plant backwashes, all that water that is pumped into the filters overflows and goes to the lagoons. And then from the lagoons, um, the solid material will, will settle out and all that flow is then discharged to the river. With the flow equalization tank, we can now um, move the, the flow into this tank and then recycle it back into the plant. So we're not um, discharging 100 or 200,000 gallons of clean treated water on a daily basis. Um, so it, it's just a more um, green approach and it's better use of our resources. Yeah, I apologize for the photo in the light of the desk. But here is the, um, I can't barely see it. But <laughs> this is where the old finished water pump station used to be. And over here is the, uh, the Bartlett Pond pump station. That area now, there's the pump station. It's all been um, demolished, removed, and then reseeded. Um, in the background, you can see where they have uh, all, that's all the construction related to the three-year bridge project. And then this is, I just have some photos going through the, the water plant um, to show you the areas that, uh, where work was done. Here, you know, we put in, 
what, you can't tell it's all new ceiling, but there's sprinkler piping, electrical conduits, uh, all the floors have been repainted. In this area, we have the rapid mixers, and these two things sticking up here. Those were all replaced below ground. Um, the area was cleaned and painted. One thing about a water treatment plant is that you can't see a lot of the process work because it's in tanks and it's all enclosed. So you have to see, show your eyes. Here's another chemical storage area. You can see the red piping here going up. That's the new sprinkler system that was installed. And then here we have the, uh, the filter room um, where we have new control panels that were installed. Um, we we're actually backwashing at this time because you can't tell from the photo. But this time is over here in the backwash. And then uh, around the, uh, the exterior of the building, we replaced all the windows, new roof. Uh, we've got a new sign uh, and then a new perimeter fence that goes around the entire facility. Um, as you may recall, I mean, dating back to 9-11, um, there was a lot of emphasis on trying to uh, you know, make sure that these types of facilities were secure. So, we now have a fence that uh, completely encloses the facility. And last but not least, we have the, uh, the budget, current versus original. You can see that originally we had estimated, or the, the appropriation that was made for this project was 18.75. Um, we benefited on each phase of the project from uh, lower than its anticipated bid cost, so our construction costs. Um, you can see that there, it's about 12.8 versus the 14 million that was estimated. Um, engineering has been pretty much, um, there's only been a small increase there, and, and that was mostly attributed to the phase one work that was done on the well. um, Because we were trying to uh, maintain the integrity of the existing one, we, did, we had to do some extraordinary, extraordinary measures to protect it, um, which resulted in both additional construction costs and engineering costs. Um, so you can see at this point in time, our, uh, our current estimated cost of three phases of work is just over $16 million. Um, so we're well, well, well on this project. Any questions? Sorry, it's been like four minutes. <laughs> no problem. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in terms of odor control for the sewer plant, um, how, how has that been over the last few months? And if it has not been where we want it to be, what are the likelihood of it getting better? Well, one of the things that has been going ongoing the last, I guess, three months is we have been doing work on the primary fire parts, which has required taking one of those tanks down in order to do work on, uh, on the tank, which it, it kind of stresses the plant because it's intended to have both um, working at the same time. Um, so periodically we'll get orders from that, um, especially when they take the tank, tank down because you got a picture, it's a 10 or 12 foot depth of the tank and probably uh, 8 to 10 feet of that is liquid, but then as you get down to the bottom, you reach the solid level. And when you're draining that tank, um, it can be a, uh, an odorous, effort, um, but I'm happy to report that as of last week, they completed all the um, work on those tanks, so they should be up and down. There should be no need to drain them in the future. Um, the other issue or item that we have um, that to address, and it's not really part of the, um, the treatment plant project as far as the upgrade, but it's part of the normal maintenance, is the odor control facility that we use, it's a biofilter. Um, that is scheduled to be replaced sometime later this spring um, because it's one of those things where it uses uh, compost chips and it's, you need to replace those every five years um, and, and five years is up. So we need to do that work. Um, <coughs> President? A second question. It's my understanding that a lot of the sludge management, which was done partly outdoors, uh, previously has been moved indoors. Is that completely indoors now since yes. the Fournier presses and the elimination of filter presses was supposed to have reduced uh, odor coming from that particular location? Yes, during, uh, during the, 
major part of the work, we had a temporary facility located. Um, it was in a white film truck tent. Right. Um, the mobile press was outside. Um, we weren't, there wasn't much we could do for order control there. That was in operation for I think 14 months. And they moved that equipment, I think it was in October. Okay. Um, we started using the forming presses in September, um, but at the time the building was still open. Um, the building is fully enclosed now. All the doors are closed. Uh, the odor control piping is hooked up. The trucks so are filled indoors now. The trucks are filled indoors. The trucks fit indoors. Um, as you recall, the old building, they, they, they didn't fit. They kind of stuck outside. Um, so yeah, I mean, all the odors are being contained within the building. Um, at the same time. Just to follow up, because I've been getting a lot of complaints, mm -hmm. not my one, but uh, about the odor. Uh, through last Friday, I haven't heard anything. So, so as I understand it, um, the, the part of that should not be a problem anymore. But there may be some odor through April when that biofilter is replaced? Um, yeah, I, don't, I don't really think the, the biofilter, the work on the biofilter will impact that much. Um, the, you know, like I said, the primary clarifier work, they, we put the second one back online last week. Okay. So that may be an issue. But at the same time, I always tell people, never lose sight of the fact that it is a sewage treatment plant. So to think that it's never going to smell, I think is unrealistic. It's a biological process. Um, it can get upset by you know things that get discharged in the system, um, and they're out of our, out of our control. And it's not something that can just flip the switch and, and make it go away. It does take time to um, regrow or reinstate itself. So um, you know, I think the guys at the plant are doing the best they can. They add chemicals where they can to try and reduce odors to the extent possible, but um, you know, it's, so it's, it's never going to eliminate. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't want to give you, you know, walk out of here and everyone thinks, oh, it's never going to smell again, because that's, that's not the case. So I'm wondering, <clears throat> and I'm just speculating here, when, when you're working in that plant, can you tell if there's odor escaping? Yes, yeah. you can. Right, so, so there would be no value to having a hotline where people could call in and tell you that and then realize it's wrong. So you know when it's wrong. Yeah. But I know at the same time, the mayor's office field calls all the time and those get sent mm -hmm. right to us and, and uh, you know, we'll investigate if, if there's a problem. Sometimes it's not always a plan. Um, yep. And sometimes it's, it's really low time. Yeah. 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 That's Thank you. Um, Peter, this is great. I, I'm uh, always fascinated looking at infrastructure come alive, whether in person going to the plants or, or seeing the video and whatnot. Um, just a quick question. As, um, as the teams have been going out over the years to, um, uh, you mentioned going across Story Ave and putting a liner in there. You mentioned changing the Green Street uh, 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 pipe from six inches to eight inches and so forth. As during all this work, from your perspective, or maybe even from Mr. Dugan for that matter, what is the state of all of the pipe work you know, across the city? I know it's some, some pipes are very old, but generally speaking, are they, wor are they working? Are they, um, are they reliable? Is there a point when you know, more might need to be replaced? I'm just wondering kind of big picture, you know, in terms of the state of the, the what's below ground. Um, you know, from the sewer side of things, I think um, the system is in fairly good shape. Um, back in the early 2000s, the city did spend a couple, two, three million on doing rehabilitation work okay. on, the, on the, the parts of the system that were uh, leaking or showing signs of structural defects. Uh, I know the sewer uh, department has a five-year capital plan where they've identified to do improvements where they know they have problems. Um, 
On the water side of things, um, I would defer to Dan Lynch mm -hmm. to give you an update on that. Sure. Um, but at the same time, I know that you know the true measure of the system really is during the winter and how many breaks they're dealing with. And I know they're dealing with some breaks, but it's not um, it's not out of control. Right. Um, so you know we both the water and sewer commission they, they have capital plans and, and uh, you know the moving through those capital plans to make sure that they make the necessary improvements. Okay. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you all. On to communication five. It's a letter from Roger W. Foster uh, addressed to the City Council, states in part, purpose of this uh, transfer of development of this report <clears throat> requested by Mayor Holidays to clarify a comprehensive solution to the central waterfront dilemma. Um, he also says he made an application to be appointed to the upcoming vacancy on the NRA. Please let this packet serve as a request for your support. It goes on to for two or three more paragraphs. I'll read them if you would like, Mr. President. Motion to receive and file. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Communication six. Motion to receive and file. Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Move on to appointments. Appointment number one. Josh Castellers, no. 50. Nope. Um, Leslie Eckel, 36 Warren Street, Fruit Street, Local Historic District Commission until March 1st, 2017. Motion to approve. Motor, motion to approve first reading. Motion to what? Motion to approve first reading. So it's received and filed. Rece received and filed, correct. Sorry. Second. Second. Discussion? Yeah. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Josh Castler, 15 Cutting Drive, Mosley Woods Commission until January 31st, 2017. Barry J. McBride, 5 Pine Street, Salisbury, Assistant Wiring Inspector, January 31st, 2015. Daniel J. Cullen, 16 Boyd Drive, Newburyport Housing Authority, January 1st, 2019. Kristen M. Farrell, 28 Spofford Street, Disabilities Commission, January 31st, 2017. Mark E. Billado, 63 High Street to the Historic Commission until May 1st, 2017. Motion to approve collectively. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 A one reappointment, Andrew R. Port, 12 Central Place, Saugus, uh, Director of Planning and Development, January 31st, 2017. Second. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <clears throat> I seem to have forgot one this thing. Um, <laughs> um, Richard B. Jones, 283 High Street City Clerk, January 31st, 2017. Who? Motion to uh, approve. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Order number one, dated January 27, 2014, City Council establishes a tree commission revolving fund in accordance with 44 section 53E and one half. Source of the fund shall be fined. Voluntary payments, fees, charges, contributions, donations, grants, insurance settlements, and other payments received from private individuals, businesses, government entities, and persons or businesses making payment to the city for damage caused to trees located on city property. Um, would you like me to read it all, Mr. President? No. Okay. Submitted, Charles Tonto, Chair, Budget and Finance Committee. Motion to approve. Discussion? Um, I met with uh, the, the chairman of the, of the Tree Commission and a couple other members, and we discussed this. Um, it, uh, I think uh, the, the funds that have been raised, uh, Hugh Kelleher, made a donation 100 years ago, years ago, $100 years ago. Uh, it's, it now has about 100 years ago. You, so. sorry. Uh, the, uh, He's not that old. Uh, and uh, the establishment of a revolving uh, fund, 
Uh, for the tree commission, uh, just simply, it, it's prudent. Uh, the fund would have to be renewed uh, with the budget every year, and uh, this will, will allow the tree commission to further its, its mission. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Dated January 21st, 2014, that the City Council of the City of Newburyport accepts with gratitude the gift in the amount of $2,314 from Ken Jackman, 114 High Street, resident, for the purchase and installation of four cast iron bollards on the sidewalk at the northwest corner of the intersection of State and High. Motion approved. Second. Second. Session. Two quick questions, and certainly this, this seems like a good idea, and I know um, Mr. Jackman was, was before us recently. Um, my question is, is, is the order's written, the, the $2,314 sounds like it's going to cover all four, but is it more of a split cost with the city for the, for the, uh, for the letter? And my second question is, are the columns going to interfere at all with um, access on that sidewalk? I know there's a light stand there. Um, and thinking about wheelchair access and strollers and things of that nature. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, there's a letter attached um, from Mr. Jackman. Uh, this is a matching amount for a total of 4628. Uh, that's a letter dated uh, November 20th, 2013. Uh, I know with the traffic and uh, traffic safety advisory committee, um, we talked about the placement of these to make sure that um, the uh, handicap access and the uh, pedestrian access um, actuator were easily accessible. Um, so we're working with DPS on that. Uh, we're thinking that this is going to have to wait until we reset some of the curbs because they are, they are in. Um, bad stead, basically because vehicles coming off State Street are turning right onto the sidewalk and digging the curb down. So those are going to be re reset. So it's going to be a, um, a little bit of a project, but something that really needs to be done. Thank you. discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We're going to audiences. First one is section 13168, parking restricted on certain streets. This is the one you would see on your desk. No person shall park any vehicle on the following streets or portions of streets as indicated below Franklin Street. The extent is no parking westerly side only of Franklin Street from the property line between 10 Franklin Street and 6 Franklin Street and running in a northerly direction to Water Street. Submitted Councilor Allison Hartquist. Motion to refer to public safety. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Ordinance 2 is section 13-180, resident parking. Add uh, to G2, Fair Street between Water Street and Liberty Street. Submitted, Councilor Jared J. Argerman. Motion to refer to public safety. Second. Discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? One to ordinance three. Ordinance three uh, is a zoning ordinance amendment uh, entitled Interim Demolition Control Overlay District, which um, <clears throat> goes on for pages. It um, Maybe I should read the purpose, which is uh, section 18B. Interim Demolition Control Overlay District um, and uh, the same special permit district shall be established due to the unique land use pattern and architectural, cultural, and economic and cultural character of the buildings, structures, and lots, both individually and as a group that are located in the historic residential neighborhoods of the city. This section is intended to encourage the implementation of the recommendation of the city's 1991 Historic Preservation Plan, 2001 Master Plan, and 2003 Waterfront Strategic Plan, all as amended and supplemented from time to time and otherwise to promote the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the city by, among other things, protecting the land use plan pattern, architectural, cultural, economic, political, and social heritage, 
of the city through the regulation of proposed demolition of historic buildings and structures located in residential neighborhoods of the city, which will help to maintain and uh, perpetuate the established skills of local architects, craftspeople, and tradespeople, promote energy efficiency, smart growth, and affordable housing through adaptive reuse, and enhance opportunities for cultural tourism. Mo motion to refer to planning and development. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Ordinance 4 is <clears throat> right here. Off-street parking regulations, uh, again, uh, it goes on for a number of pages. It's submitted by Councillor Eigerman. Um, I don't know if I dare to summarize uh, for the Councillor. Essentially sets up a uh, fund that would be used to hold monies that would be contributed by uh, developers or other property owners who wish to use the parking lots in their count. Motion to refer to uh, Planning and Development and the Traffic Safety Committee. Second. In discussion? <coughs> um, is, the tra is the Traffic Safety Committee a committee of the City Council? No, but my understanding is they are an advisory committee for parking concerns. No? Yeah, uh, for traffic concerns, I think, safety concerns. Yeah. Mr. President, I just think it would be cleaner either just to go to planning and development or planning and development and committee of the whole, and that way we get that other input. Uh, you know, it's, obviously there's a lot of angles to this. I mean, but certainly it's a zoning, zoning thing, first of all. <coughs> planning and development is fine with me. I'll amend my motion. Is that as a committee of the whole also? I would think so, yeah. I, I think, I think in the previous issue also we might want to just have as a committee of the whole just to, I mean, there are going to be big issues and I think have the council along for the whole ride would, would be good. Motion? M motion to refer to planning and development of the whole. And committee of the whole. And committee of the whole. Okay, second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Another small one, number five. Right, it's the interim downtown overlay district, um, IDOD, uh, which again, it goes on for a number of pages, um, and I wouldn't do it justice by summarizing. Submitted by Councillor Eigenman. Motion to refer to planning and development. Second. Yes. 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 Thank you. The second? Second. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We're going to committee items. Where's the finance? Um, I'd like to move uh, the third item under uh, 16, which is the creation of trust fund for other post-employment benefit liabilities. I move that we uh, remove from committee. Point of information. Uh, it should be removed from committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Go ahead. Take a motion. Um, uh, President, this, the, the motion uh, will create a trust fund. Second. Um, we are, uh, uh, th the motion calls for the creation of a trust fund uh, in order to, um, to, to establish a, a fund for the um, other employment um, benefits, post-employment benefits. Essentially, uh, for health uh, insurance for city employees. Um, this motion in particular uh, is uh, to set up the trust fund is important uh, for this city's financial um, 
uh, bond rating and for assuring uh, that 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 uh, the accrediting agencies, Standard & Poor, for instance, uh, see that the city is beginning to address it. Uh, the city has approximately uh, a 30, 64 million unfunded uh, pension liability, as many other communities do, uh, and the credit crediting agencies would like to see us uh, begin to make a gesture, I would think of it, uh, to, to address that. And this would simply set up that trust fund. Uh, incidentally, it uh, passed unanimously out of budget and finance. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's the trust fund. Anything else? Yes. Uh, move to remove from committee item one the um, uh, free cash transfer to the OPEP trust fund. Second. Move to committee. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion? Uh, move to approve. Uh, and, uh, you know, this is 25, it's, it's a, a token amount of money. Uh, in the face of what the city uh, owes, but it establishes uh, funds in the, in the fund so that uh, um, it, we, the, show, the city is showing that it is aware of it and will um, keep the uh, bond rating companies happy for a while. Uh, I would point out that in Standard & Poor raised the bond rating from AA to AA+. Plus. Uh, they noted the liability. Um, they said that unless there was a major change, uh, it, they were watching it. It was some concern. They did not anticipate it would change that way unless there was a change. So it's good. Second that motion. Thank you, Mr. President. If I could direct a question to the chair, if not to the mayor's office. Um, in the description of this transfer request, it mentioned that this appropriation is to quote unquote begin funding. Um, to your knowledge, should the council expect to see future transfer requests from free cash to this account? Um, my knowledge, not this year. All right. Uh, the, the, this situation is very much in flux. Um, the, every community in the state, if not the country, by the way, is facing this problem. Uh, and, uh, the, you know, the state uh, will, will take probably take some action to remediate it. Um, it's not clear whether or not uh, there'll be a demand from free cash or anywhere else to put more funds into it. And just, just to add a little bit of context from uh, past budget and finance uh, committees uh, of, the, of the council over the years, Mr. Squillis has educated us uh, from time to time on this. And, and these, these long-term liabilities are, are very fluid, very hard to predict because they're really, you know, 20 and 30 years out. Um, Mr. Squillis had the analogy, it'd be sort of like if you had a mortgage of uh, several hundred thousand dollars, two hundred thousand dollars, and your, your bank was upset with you because you didn't have the two hundred thousand dollars on hand to pay off, you know, what you need to pay off in 20 years. Um, a lot of these um, accounting um, regulations came into effect with companies in the, in the middle part of the last decade that went belly up, the, the Enrons and companies like that and left their employees uh, high and dry and weren't able to fulfill their, one, their pension obligations, but also their um, post-retirement health insurance and things like that. I mean, the reality is, um, with the exceptions of places like Detroit and, and probably a few others, um, cities just don't go belly up, knock on wood. I hope I haven't just jinxed us. So, you know, the fa you know we're unlikely to go bankrupt and then and leave our retirees on the hook. Um, and out, out in the cold, um, you know, we will continue to operate as we have for 250 years, I believe it is. Um, so so that, that's really a little bit of it. So in some ways, it's, it's one of these, um, um, you know, there may be much ado about nothing, but it's, it's good just to take a step to establish the fund and at least put a little bit of money in it now, and hopefully we won't have to sock in too much money. We've always been a pay-as-you-go. We've been able to keep up with our obligations. Most of the pensions now are, are pretty much self-funded by the employees. And, uh, and we're trying to get that way with health retirement as well. Third discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. <coughs> Anything else coming up? Uh, um, 
move uh, question two, uh, transfer of free cash to the mayor group. <coughs> All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So we move this committee. Motion. Uh, Mr. President, thi this motion um, comes. Motion, yeah. motion to approve motion first. Sorry. first. Motion to approve. Second. Uh, discussion? I yeah. will learn. <laughs> uh, this motion comes before you with a uh, split vote. Uh, two of us in budget and finance favored, one person was opposed. Um, this is a, a request for a transfer from free cash to it uh, for the rest of this fiscal year to, so that the city can have a grant writer. Um, my understanding that the, the grant writer would work uh, in, on both the city side and the school side uh, to uh, research uh, uh, grant opportunities and to apply for one uh, on behalf of the city. Uh, my, my own opinion is that, uh, my understanding is, is that the uh, mayor is familiar with this person. It's under $10,000, so it doesn't have to go out to bid. Um, and uh, I, would, I would hate to see this delayed because I think over the next few months we we ought to get in there and take advantage of uh, grant opportunities. Thank you. Council Corner? You take the mystery out of budget finance. Um, no, I was uh, the one. Um, I'm not necessarily voting against this, um, but there are so many unanswered questions with this that um, I was hoping that we uh, might keep this in committee. Um, simply my questions are, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's under the bid of $10,000. It's 9775 It goes until the end of the fiscal year when most likely we're going to um, try to bankroll this again. So I am questioning the spirit of what we're doing, especially when this is a contract and I don't see a scope of work. I don't see um, um, goals, objectives. I don't see what we want to accomplish. Um, with all those being said, I, I think it's a, it's a good idea. But I'd like to see, when you hire someone um, in a contract role, uh, there, are, there are certain things that uh, you expect. Um, how many grants are you going to write? How many grants are you going to apply for? Whatever it is, what grants we are looking at. Um, and I, I know that grants are more or less smoke and mirrors as far as what's out there. You, you may not know, um, but let's face it, we know what we're, we're looking for. So I am asking um, that we, we just look for a scope of work. The other, the other question here is the, the dollar amount. Um, I don't know if we can get a better grant writer for more money, less money, if this is the going, the going number. Um, I, I recognize what uh, Councillor um, Contar has said, that uh, the um, mayor knows this person. That, that's not a problem. I think that as a city councillor, my goal, um, my job, is to be the check and the balance. Once everything is checked and balanced, I'll go for it. But until such time, I'm just hoping that we can uh, get more information. Thank you, Mr. President. Just to solve the third part of the mystery, I did vote in favor of it in committee. Um, so now you know who, how we all voted on that. Um, I, I did get a little bit more information after the meeting. As, as Councilor Cronin uh, discussed, there were some questions uh, that we had, and, and I didn't have uh, the, the full packet um, that we had from our, our last council meeting. Um, this, the average, uh, the, the hourly amount would be $85. I think that's in a, in a relatively uh, reasonable range for this. Um, if we did, did put it out to bid, I think we would find some, something in the $60 to $100 uh, dollar an hour range. Um, this would be for five hours a week approximately. Um, there could be more or less depending on what, what was going. And as Councillor Cronin um, alluded to, the, the smoke and mirrors, I mean, is really the unpredictable, unpredictability of whatever grants may be coming up. I mean, sometimes there are, are grants that you know will come up at a certain time of year. Um, and the expectation from the mayor's director of, of policy and administration and the mayor um, was that this person probably would work on, you know, six or so 
six to eight grants over the course of the six months. Um, you know, I'm, I'm comfortable voting for it tonight. I think going onward, because we have had this conversation over the last couple of years with previous counselors, Jenny Lamar, um, who's uh, now working in human resources for the city, was doing this, this function. And I think we've brought in um, people from time to time. But I think we should have a, um, a, just a more thorough examination for it to see that we are getting uh, a bang for our buck. We talked a little bit in committee about whether you bring this in-house and have this done by a permanent position. My own sense would be I'd, I'd almost rather have um, a, a ready vendor list when a grant comes up that department heads or the mayor or the director of policy and administration identify, then we go to that ready vendor list and then we, we pick you know, one of those, um, those grant writers that has time to work on that grant and that way we can um, more accurately um, peg the, what we're spending to the demand. Um, but I think for now, I think I'm, I'm comfortable voting with it and I don't, we're getting into the fiscal year so I just soon pass it. Thank you, Mr. President. If I could direct a question to the chair, um, committee chair. The, um, the mayor's memo of January 7th indicated that um, this position would be split between the city and the school. I'm wondering if that point came up in the, your committee discussions. In particular, I'm wondering whether the 9775 requested is inclusive of the school department amount of work and or if the school department would be contributing a different amount. Uh, is the 9775 for everything, or is the 9775 inclusive of the school aspect, in which case the question would be, could the city council fund 50% and the school committee fund the other 50%? Um, it was brought up in discussion. Um, Councilor Cronin uh, said that he, he was unclear uh, as to whether this was going to be all on the school side. Uh, or, or split or on the city side or split between, uh, but we did not address the possibility to have the school side pick up some of this cost. I can just uh, speak to that one point, at least especially for this fiscal year, the school's looking at a pretty significant uh, deficit, so they wouldn't be able to fund. Um, any of this particular contract. Um, and the five hours a week is split between city grant needs and school grant needs. And just look, going back uh, to the scope of services question um, included in the packet, the page after the mayor's uh, memo talked specifically about the grant opportunities um, this company would be working on, looking both generally at schools, but um, parks grants, Green Communities Grants, Transient Boating Facility, um, that project that's, that's ramping up, as well as uh, the intermodal uh, parking facility. I know that there are two uh, grant programs in particular that are due the middle of February that she would be working on immediately in terms of uh, putting that uh, grant application together. Thank you, Council um, I don't have the packet from last uh, meeting where we had the resume, but I'm assuming somewhere she's claimed how much she's brought in in regards to grants. And from my perspective, I would like to see how much bang we get for our buck. So an investment of 97 compared to what? Like, what are we gonna, looking to get? Because if we're going to get a couple much. more thousand, and hopefully more, this sounds like it's a good bet. Yeah, I mean, any one of the particular uh, grant opportunities that, that this person would be working on would be well in excess of that. We're talking tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, her resume speaks to raising over $3 million uh, over the past 12 years doing grant writing. And uh, she's worked with uh, Haverhill, Malden, and Wakefield in the past, uh, um, in addition to a lot of uh, nonprofits. So it sounds like a good investment. How's okay. argument? Uh, just a, a question for those that are on the committee. Uh, so essentially we're buying 115 hours. Is that, is that really how the contract works? I just want to understand it. So I, I mean, I, I didn't bring a calculator, but I think I have that right. Yeah, I had it around 100, and, and, you know. Okay, so it's, could it be, we think that'll get us to the end of the fiscal year, but essentially it's 115 hours, whether it's six months or nine months. That's the question. Mm -hmm. 
So hopefully it will last till the end of the fiscal year. Well, yeah, that's yeah. yeah, so so that uh, the way the contract will be drawn up, uh, it will be uh, not to exceed that number okay. um, because uh, otherwise uh, that would be considered bid splitting under the Inspector General's procurement regulations. So um, it will be for the balance of this fiscal year. And again, we'll be looking for FY15 uh, as to whether we'll be contracting this out or bringing it in-house. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Hold. Thank you, Councilor Tonta. That's worth the debate. License and permit. <coughs> <laughs> Thank you. Motion to remove item number one, LCA Motors. And second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Hold. Go ahead. Uh, motion to approve. Second. Discussion. Uh, license and permits met this evening, and all their paperwork is in order, <coughs> and it was voted un unanimously to approve it. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. 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 Okay, nothing else coming out. Neighborhood and city services? Nothing at this time. Planning and development? Uh, Mr. President, nothing coming out, but just wanted to, um, again, remind councillors that we have a... Uh, planning and Development and Committee of the Whole meeting tomorrow night at 7 o'clock upstairs in the auditorium. Um, we're, we're basically, it's a listening session for us to hear from citizens and stakeholders um, about what their feelings are on the waterfront. So uh, I certainly hope uh, most of you can attend that. Um, planning and Development's briefly going to meet after uh, tonight's council meeting just to uh, line out how we want to run that meeting um, and try to get us out by 3 p.m. 3 a.m. <laughs> 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 Um, so uh, I think we'll have a good turnout, and uh, we'll take it from there. Thank you. Is there any time limit tomorrow? For you, you could speak as long as you want. No, I, I, we, I, think, um, I think we'll see what the uh, attendance is and then try to divide the minutes and, and maybe make it a less than three-hour meeting, less than two-hour meeting. So it might, it might end up being a two-minute, three-minute per person kind of thing. And, uh, and written testimony, written statements would be most welcome. Certainly people can read them, but then we can create a record that we can share with the public. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Public safety? Uh, motion to remove item three. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Go ahead. Motion to approve. Second. 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 Any discussion? Council Cronin. This is um, the annual uh, Frigid Fiber Road Race put on by um, the Rotary Club, which, by the way, donated some money that <laughs> <laughs> to the city. Um, this is an event that's been going on for, um, I'm going to say, 20 plus years. The reason I bring this up and I'm talking a little ad nauseum about it is that um, you'll notice a Scribner's error <coughs> on here. The race begins at Michael's Harborside and then the race course goes straight on High Street. Well, you can't get there from here. But it does go up Tinkham Street um, to High Street and then follows the uh, the High Street swap in Merrimack, Kent, Washington Rail Trail. Um, like I said, they've been doing this for years. It's a uh, local event, a successful event. I would agree. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Anything else? Nothing for public utilities? Nothing tonight. Rules? Nothing to report. Put of the auto. Council Kinsey. I have an invitation to my fellow counselors. Uh, I'm a youngest son. He's a first grader at the Resnahan School. Uh, I was talking to his teacher, Mrs. Doyle. Talking about the need for children to move. That they show up at 10 minutes, they need to get up and move. Um, or they lose attention. And there's a lot of dominant effect that goes with that. Lost attention and the behavior. And as such, um, another hat I wear is in the health and wellness industry, so I offered to go in and teach some movement exercises that kind of, you know, don't, they keep you in a tight ratio of space. So I said to Mrs. Doyle, it'd be a nice opportunity to um, multitask, and I love to connect the city and the school whenever possible. Uh, as you witnessed here today, there's often conversations about city versus school, or this budget versus that budget. I love to eventually make the conversation uh, in that it's one. And so my invitation, if you choose to accept the challenge, is to come in and partake in the movement exercise as, so as a, a means to connect schools, the kids, civic engagement, meeting their city councilors. No pressure. It's 8.45 Thursday morning. 
Where? Bresnahan School, Mrs. Doyle's class. Partake. I'll be there in spirit. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. That makes two of us. Anything else? Is that 10 minutes? You need the city council for <laughs> Playing contest. <laughs> we'll have, have a discussion from the mayor from Island Water and Sewer Update. Thank you, President O'Brien. Thank you, members of the city council. And I apologize for some of you who have heard sort of this, this chronology of what's happened, but I thought it was very important for the newer councillors to get up to speed in terms of, you know, what's happened with the Plum Island Water and Sewer Project and take you up as far as I can in terms of before I request we go into executive session to deal with immediate pending litigation. Uh, I'd like to introduce John Eric White, who is our city engineer, who has um, been with the team working on this very complex and difficult process um, since the date of the first initial water break. As you know, this was a 24 or so million dollar project that was uh, completed in roughly 05 and was, um, again, like some capital projects that we've had in the city, have had um, multiple uh, mayors overseeing this project. The way this project was designed, there was a feasibility study that was conducted. Uh, some of the uh, information that you heard in public comment was absolutely correct, but again, we can't go back. We have to go forward now and uh, figure out what, what to do. Uh, there was a working group that consisted of members uh, from Newburyport and Newbury who worked together, who oversaw this project. Um, there were uh, lots of issues with this. Number one, a lot of the uh, residents in the community did not want it. Members of the city council weren't sure that they wanted water and sewer out to Plum Island. You know, ultimately, uh, the litigation was, was, was settled and the um, city council, um, not unanimously, but uh, uh, voted in support of the water and sewer project. Uh, there were a lot of moving parts to it. There had to be an overlay district. There had to be a memorandum of understanding. The overlay district restricted additional um, development out there. And then uh, the project began to unfold. Uh, Camp Dresser McKee, now Camp Dresser McKee, CDM Smith, was the lead on the contract. And there were two other contracts, uh, who, one who completed phase one, <coughs> SB Construction, and DC. Did I get that right, Eric? Uh, who did phase two um, construction. Then uh, um, the project reached substantial completion, was accepted, um, and we move forward, and all of a sudden it's April 27th, 2011. And uh, I hear that there is a water main break out on Plum Island at the directional drill area, which is near um, Plum Island Grill, just before as you come over the bridge down in that area. And I, of course, uh, red flags were immediately raised because, you know, this is a brand new system. How could we possibly have a water main break? Um, somebody mentioned maybe it had something to do with uh, flushing hydrants. But anyway, needless to say, when uh, John Eric White, Jamie Tukolo, and Dan Lynch walked into my office and the looks on their faces, I knew something was wrong. They uh, proceeded to explain to me what happened with the water main break and they put two uh, pieces of water main in front of me. One from a water main that they replaced 100 years ago and one from the directional drill area and asked me to pick which one I picked wrong. So obviously that meant that the system was corroding very quickly and we were very concerned about what we found. Uh, what, of, what was most concerned to me, you know, having a uh, legal background was where was the statute of repose or staff, statute of limitations and how can we protect our rights. That was absolutely critical and we had a very short, we had um, to the following September of 12 in order to retain our rights uh, in terms of, of, of stopping the tolling of this uh, statute of repose or limitations. Uh, then we began to 
I asked the gentlemen if they would please go out and do a couple other test pits. When they opened up the test pits, they began to discover that the materials that were used in these sites were corrosive. Um, at that point, after we felt that we had sufficient information to go forward, I called Attorney Blodgett and uh, went to meet with him and told him about my concerns. Uh, he assigned a lieutenant to work with us as a, who reviewed all of the documentation we had. We were very careful about videotaping, uh, pictures, dating, recording everything that we found as we uh, uncovered the test pit, different test pits, and were identifying similar corrosive materials being used. After we um, had a chance to have the detective re working with us review all of this information, they felt there was sufficient information for us to present a case to the inspector general, which in fact we did. <coughs> and again, each of these steps as you move forward take many, many months. Our work with the inspector general was about nine months <coughs> uh, in terms of at that point we, you know, I uh, came to the city council. Uh, we weren't quite sure where we were going with that, so some of it was discussed in executive session, some of it was discussed in, uh, thank you, John Eric, um, and some of it was discussed in a, a public forum. We just weren't sure what we were dealing with and where we were going at that point. Um, so after working with the Inspector General for about nine months and they assigned a independent engineer to work with us, then we began to realize that we had probably 58,000 pieces of documentation that were in various places all over the city, some of it were missing, that we had to assemble this record. And this you know, took a tremendous amount of time and energy on the part of our staff to put this whole record together. Part of the reason is that some of the records <coughs> were being stored in an outbuilding at the wastewater treatment plant that were destroyed during the Mother's Day flood. Uh, so we had to go back and begin compiling this record. Um, so we decided it was time for us to pull CDM Smith in for our first meeting. And we met here, and our first meeting didn't go all that well because initially they were, um, you know, oh, well, there's corrosion and there's corrosion. And then I said, okay, how about this corrosion? How about <coughs> this corrosion? And we began to really push them in terms of what we were finding and what we, were, we had uncovered. And, uh, you know, things started to change, and they began to... Um, you know, sort of sit up and take notice that there was a serious <clears throat> problem that was happening and unfolding before the city here. We were fortunate that we were able to get them to agree as well as SMB construction and DNC construction to sign uh, to stop the tolling of the statute of limitations, uh, statute of repose. So that was a very important step forward in, in this process. After um, some difficult conversations with the city council, it was pretty clear to us that we needed better legal representation. So we went and hired Ruben and Rudman from um, Boston to, to work with us on a um, recommendation of our representative Costello. This is an organiz a legal firm that has a lot of experience with this type of contract litigation. Um, and uh, I can tell you that I'm very, very pleased that we have engaged them in, uh, to represent the city in this process. So um, continued our meetings with CDM Smith and uh, to date we've probably had eight meetings with them um, between meetings in Cambridge, meetings here. And um, it's, a, it's a slow process. They present us with a fix. We're not happy with what they present. We consult with our attorney and we've hired a uh, expert engineer who was not easy to find because you look at the reputation of CDM Smith and their international status, you don't just reach out to an engineer who's willing to take on a company of this, of this magnitude. I have to say that they have been at the table but it's been a slow process in terms of us moving forward. Um, what we had to, really get documentation of was what is it we were dealing with in terms of the materials in the system. So we went out and with CDM Smith and we were able to take uh, borings and were able to uh, compile a bunch of samples and work through the lab. We identified a lab called Corrosion Probe in Newark, Delaware, who would do the testing. We wanted to ensure a chain of custody of all the materials that we took out of the system. And so uh, we also hired a lab um, that is just doing a fabulous job, mass 
materials research out of Boylston. And so the lab, um, one of the lead lab technicians and scientists went with John Eric White to um, follow the materials as they went to the lab, were there for several days as they watched the testing that, that happened. Um, that was completed this past June. I'm going to back up a little bit. Um, during Hurricane Sandy, October 29th at 4.30 in the morning, we experienced another water main break on the opposite side of uh, where the directional drill was, where we, um, again, uh, very similar uh, kinds of situations that we saw corrosion deterioration of the bolts. Um, and again, just you know, a grave concerns um, that sort of added to the picture. Once we completed the um, work with the inspector general, all of this, all things were sort of happening simultaneously. Um, we had a meeting with the attorney general uh, at the state house and presented all of our findings to date, and they have accepted the case. And now we're working on two tiers: a criminal and a civil case. Um, and I will discuss with you a little bit further about what's happening with uh, where we are with those cases in executive session after I finish the update in terms of what I can present publicly. Um, we are concerned at, at this point about over 18,000 bolts that are in the system. CDM Smith has given us their next round of fixes that they want to do very quickly, and that will include sleeving with polyethylene the uh, ductile iron that is on the two water mains that should have been done initially, and also introducing cathodic protection, which also should have been done at the time that these were installed. They're also going to try and change out any of the metals that they can and replace it with PVC. Um, and so we question some of the, um, the use of this type of PBC with this interlocking uh, mechanism because we wanted to be sure that there was some track record of use with this material in uh, other parts of the country, particularly in, in, in uh, a cold climate. So um, they've just sent us their latest drawings, latest plans this past Friday um, that is being reviewed by our team, and that will include uh, addressing the two issues at the uh, two water main breaks. But we also pulled DEP into this, and we're very grateful that they sat at the table with us at our last meeting here just before Christmas with CDM Smith. And DEP um, has also been able to put a little muscle behind what we've been you know, sort of pushing to get done. And in addition to fixing the two water main breaks, there's 147 hydrants that have to be uh, repaired. Uh, apparently, at some point during the uh, construction process, um, someone decided to change out ductile iron connections to the hydrants with PVC, which you never would put PVC attached to fire hydrants because of the force of the water that comes out. We are not even doing flushing because we're concerned about the impact that would potentially have on the hydrants. Um, we, um, there's uh, problems with missing thruster blocks. There's problems with the bolts again. Um, so uh, DEP says once you, at the same time you're fixing the uh, two water mains and dealing with those issues, you will also fix 147 of the hydrants. So um, this is where we are in terms of what's happening with the water, what the current plans for fixing that are happening in the ground in terms of the water. But in addition to that, those of you who are on the council, uh, when I was on the council, you recall that there were problems with the air vac, the sewer system that froze up. And the problem is, is that these cans that contain the system that connect to four homes shouldn't have been placed in the road. But because of the difficulty with plot lines and lands and everything else that's out on Plum Island, these were just put wherever they could put them. And so we have figured out a way to insulate these cans so that we have prevented them from freezing. Thank you, Jamie Tuklow, and his uh, work with AirVac in terms of that piece. But we also have problems with some of the fiberglass rims that are starting to crack around these things. And there is uh, problems in the Olga Way, which is the um, mastermind, if you will, of the um, air vac system. Inside the, the system, there was the HVAC system never worked. We had problems with the computer system overheating. 
and um, trying to find ways to keep the system working and it bypassing. We also have problems with where they um, constructed an I-beam over four of the pumps, which at some point these pumps have to be pulled out and replaced. And, you know, I am not in the construction industry, but I knew when I walked into Olga Way and saw, well, aren't I-beams supposed to go out to the loading dock so you can, you know, get these big heavy pumps out onto the trucks to remove them. Same thing with the um, tank that is below ground level, which is where the sewage is, is, uh, goes into and then is pumped out and sent to the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so we have some issues with Olga Way in terms of HVAC, in terms of the you know, I-beams where they are set up, and what am I missing, John Eric? Yeah, just about all the demos. Okay. Um, but you know, there are some other you know pieces that we're concerned about. But these are the major components, and it's enough. You know, in terms of you know where where we are with this particular system. So um, I've taken you through sort of the chronology of what happened, um, but I would like to talk to you about uh, where we are with um, an up upcoming very, very significant meeting in Boston, uh, legal meeting, and about our, our, our preparatory meeting we had on Friday, which involves our detailed litigation strategy as we go forward. Um, the most important message that I can give to the public and to you as city councilors is that we are not stopping until we get this system fixed, and it will not be on the backs of any of the residents out on Plum Island. So I respectfully request that we, for it won't be a, a long executive session, I res respectfully request that we go into executive session to discuss litigation strategy about where we are at this moment in time with this particular case. We made a motion to so Second. Point for um, The mayor mentioned originally this is for immediate pending litigation. Is, is it, which is it? Immediate litigation or pending litigation? It's the same thing. Same thing. <laughs> All right. Let's go into executive session. Councilor Connell. Yes. Councilor Cronin. Yes. Councilor Eigerman. Yes. Councilor Junta. Yes. Councilor Harquist. Yes. Councilor Hirsog. Yes. Councilor Kinsey. Yes. Councilor Tontar. Yes. Councilor Vogel. Yes. Councilor Cameron. Yes. Councilor President O'Brien. Thank you. I would like to ask everyone who is not involved <coughs> in this case to please gonna, um, retire from the room. Go downstairs to make sure we're off. Tony. Tony. Make sure we're off TV. Turn off your mics, everyone. I'm yep. Right across the hall. Yeah, open that up and then hit.